back to another week of Art Life. In this week's episode, I'm going to be going further into the process of how I start a painting and everything that leads up to that process before I'm ready to work on a canvas. I'm Jessie. I've been a full-time artist for 10 years and thought it about time I start sharing my painting techniques and adventures. Subscribe to join me every week for a window into my art life. So this week I have been planning out a new painting. Um, I usually do this but never really talk about it so I thought I would talk about it this week uh, where I do a small study and experiment with colours along the side of the composition uh, for different colour palettes. I usually do a cool colour, warm, dark ranges from tonal to kind of soft greys um, and then I label everything, sometimes even labelling how I mix the colours on the palette. Um, because as you see, when you're painting on a palette, it can get quite confusing to remember what colour uh, went where. So there actually is a lot to be said for planning a painting with more meticulous attention to detail. Um, sometimes I intuit a painting. I stand in front of the canvas and I just choose what colours I fancy, what I think goes well together from experience or personal taste. That day, it's heavily based on the light, what time of year it is, seasons, particularly when your painting landscape have a major impact on the colour palette you use. So this is a very cool going into winter palette, but there are some lovely kind of soft pastels in there just to lift it a bit. Um, and sometimes even working in this way, you almost decide that actually your idea wasn't actually what you should do and you need to try some other things. So the more you prepare and create sketchbooks and palette tests, the better you are, or I am, at knowing where I should be heading in what direction with my painting. Um, so I don't know if any of you have been following me on my Instagram at Jess Oliver Art. If you have, you will know that I've been preparing some canvases to paint uh, with a base ground of kind of this lovely transparent oxide red. Um, that's a Michael Harding, um, one of their new non-absorbent acrylic primers. Hang on, let me get that for you. And anyone who's been following my Michael Harding episodes over the last few weeks where I talk about the mediums I use, um, this base ground with the primer is going to be really helpful uh, just to give every colour I use over it a sense of kind of warmth and depth that I wouldn't have had if I just painted it onto straight white canvas. If you haven't seen those videos, please go check them out. Um, so yeah, I've done my plan. I think the next step is maybe just testing out one more canvas, maybe even... A smaller one like this um, so I can figure out the kind of not mistakes but where I want the sense of depth where I want this landscape to take my mind when I look at it what I want it to do and achieve um, with the viewer so this is the thing about landscape the horizon line is everything it's where you start it's the way your eye seeks an exit and gravity when it's looking at a composition uh, so if I have a very low horizon line kind of at the bottom I have this huge sense of space in the kind of sky and vista, which can feel expansive. If I bring the horizon line all the way up to the top of the um, composition, suddenly it'll all be about the earth, the kind of detail of the ground, and maybe you won't get the same sense of space. Um, I think choosing your horizon line should be the first thing you do with a landscape because everything else can follow from your perspective. So another reason working in this very considered way where I'm planning everything, testing things out, is because it also kind of reboots my mind. It lets me know where I've been going wrong with other paintings in my practice. So this is a painting I've been working on for a few weeks. Um, I don't know if you can see that. So it's a kind of very soft landscape. And the moment I started with this other kind of little sketch study, I realized 
But the problem with this painting is that it's just too much mid-tone. I haven't really thought about my horizon line, my sense of depth and perspective. You can see from images of this that there is no kind of sense of where the viewer needs to go. It's just a bit flat. There's not that depth that I was hoping to achieve with this misty autumnal atmosphere piece. So maybe as well that while I'm working on this kind of new painting, I could kind of revamp some of this work I'm doing at the moment as well, because one painting usually feeds into another. There's never a painting you're going to do that's isolated. It's always going to kind of seep into other works you're doing, particularly if you're like me and like working on more than one painting at a time. So another key element of this kind of research preparation, test experiments for paintings, is constantly referring to an archive of books that you find incredibly helpful. Now this one is the abstraction of landscape, um, from northern romanticism to abstract expressionism. We have spoken about this one actually, maybe in a book club, um, if not I will speak about it in a future book club episode, um, but basically it has an incredible kind of collection of landscapes ranging from a great era of landscapes um, and I was looking through this last night and I came across Gerhard Richter. Now Richter is one of my, particularly with the cloudscapes I'm doing, idols. Like, I mean Tacita Dean as well at the moment is creating extraordinary cloudscapes. Um, I don't like to think of myself as a cloudscape artist um, but for references Richter and Dean are two very good references that I'm using at the moment. But particularly looking at Gerhard Richter, he can paint photographs essentially. His figuration of painting is so extraordinary that it's how he then deconstructs that and goes into more abstraction with his squeegee paintings. Um, off the top of my head, um, some of his um, landscape and hu you know huge landscape pieces with cloudscapes and seascapes, um, they're so quiet. You look at them and you hear silence. There's just such a sense of blurred movement with the light he captures and his brush strokes are almost invisible. Um, it's so inspiring but having a book like this it focuses on just a few of his works and it says by reclaiming landscape painting through the medium of photography Richter experiments with the possibility of revitalizing the traditional genre of landscape for contemporary audiences. So I think we should look a little bit about Richter's work in this episode as well just so you can see what I'm thinking about when I'm painting. Um, and it is important about revitalising this maybe old fashioned kind of form of figurative painting and making it relevant for a contemporary artist who, like myself, wants to exhibit and sell works and be be relevant, be making new works which are kind of avant-garde for me, not just be painting sort of gurgitated styles of maybe more figurative landscapes that kind of feel a bit flat. I want to create a sense of energy and purpose with my landscape. So, the research is very important for that as well. So as you can see, we've got lots to cover in this week's episode of Art Life. Hopefully we'll finally get started on the big stuff. Um, but for now, I'm going to carry on with my research into Richter and share that with you later and just carry on doing these little experiments and just kind of keep you updated on where I am with this part of the painting prep. Okay, so doing smaller studies like this is so helpful because not only can I figure out the big compositions, I can actually also have these framed and sort of sell them as part of my art practice um, as smaller gifts for people particularly leading up to Christmas. Um, and this is exactly what I've done recently. I don't really talk about frames that much, I think it would be a good time to actually open the conversation. Uh, the frame is the artist's reward. This was just a small sketch, one of the few I've had framed. This is an 8mm mount with an oak thin uh, handmade frame with museum glass. Um, there's an amazing framer, um, Hamish Bell, down the road. I've got kind of a really good relationship with him and we can always do different bespoke designs for different paintings. So this is just one kind of very simple way I have of elevating a sort of more sketchier work I do on paper. Um, and then I can sell them for a few hundred pounds rather than thousands and thousands for the very, very big work, which takes me hundreds of hours. Um, so I'm going to show you a few different uh, samples of frames and we're also going to be doing a photo shoot today of the framed works which then go on my website and I really push on my Instagram at Jess Oliver Art because um, I want to sell them, I want to get them out of my studio, I don't want to hoard all this work because if I never sold anything there'd be too much art in this room and no room to make new art so I want to shift all of this stuff and then hopefully get some new work getting going for the new year.
So let's do a photo shoot and I will talk a little bit about the works I've been doing that I've had framed. Okay, so again, when I get one of my smaller sketches and just place it inside a mount, it just kind of gives me a very general idea of what something like this would look when it had a very beautiful bespoke frame around it. Suddenly it feels like it's a, it has gravitas, it has importance and that hopefully somebody would buy it. I really like these very thin frame borders. I hate very dark clunky frames. I think sometimes it can detract from the work and it can make painting become an object. Often bad frames do ruin paintings and I rarely frame paintings themselves, but with the paperwork it just keeps it protected. So um, it's really good in a kind of domestic exhibition or commercial setting. So that's the wooden framed pieces done. something completely different. Okay, so... Lovely. Okay, so this is actually a full piece of paper. You can see I've done a, um, a raised box frame where you see slightly how I've raised the paper from the back mount. So it's got a lovely shadow. Um, again, it's just a kind of white box frame. It's Wimborne white. It's my favourite white to paint frames with. Um, again, you can see all the kind of rough edges I did with the painting itself. Um, it's smudged, it's kind of scrapey edges. It's, it's got a kind of raw quality. You can feel the physicality of me in the studio making this piece. And I actually find the cleanness of this frame, it's kind of understated beauty allows for this slightly rumpled messy um, and beautiful uh, cloud piece to feel natural so it is an artist's kind of studio piece but in framing it it gives it enough elevation that it could be in one of my exhibitions quite happily so this is the first time i've used this particular frame with something like this so it's mounted on foam which gives it a 3d quality and the paper slightly comes out at you feeling like when you're kind of exploring the composition with your eye the work is kind of almost pulling you in it's kind of leaning towards you and i like it kind of makes it feel a bit more accessible. If a frame like this is successful, I can do more. Um, and I've got one more frame to show you here now. So we'll take some photos of that and then I can talk about that one as well. It's good to have diversity. It's good to show people all the different things you can have with paperworks. Um, if I don't want to sell a canvas piece and I want to just do more sketchy stuff. So it's good to have a, a variety. So this is my biggest one on paper. It's actually in two tiers with a wooden mount, which is quite unusual, but Hamish and I thought it would look much grander to have it all in wood. Um, again, I think it frames the softness of the brush strokes beautifully. Um, again, I did a series of these because I wanted to be able to sell things under a thousand pounds. It took, again, still a lot of time, but because it was on paper, I felt that it was important to be able to make works accessible. Um, I know a lot of artists, myself included, struggle in selling work, valuing yourself, being able to stand up and say, you know, this is worth this. It's not just because it's the end product, but all of the time it takes in your education, practice, hours of work to create the final product. Picasso famously um, was approached in a Paris market by a woman with a napkin who asked if he could draw something on it for her. Um, so, and he did, and he handed it back to her and then asked, it's now a million francs. And she was like, what? But it just took you five minutes. He said, no, it took me 40 years to do that in five minutes. So that's, I think, the perfect example of how an artist values his work and his brand. So, okay, so now you've seen a range of my different frames and I'm hoping it shows you an insight into the fact that I don't only put value on my big glamorous paintings, that my sketches, my smaller studies, um, when I frame those as well, I'm doing it because I believe that they are an integral part of my practice and as important when I'm doing a body of work. I don't know anyone who might have watched the episode a few weeks ago when we were priming canvases and testing different primers. This one is actually now framed. It was using the grey primer from the non-absorbent acrylic primers. Um, I'm really pleased with it. I love how the frame um, kind of gives it a sense of vintage 
spacious airiness. Um, I am going to be putting it up for sale on my website. That's something I don't say enough actually. Please do check out my uh, website and feel free to contact me if anybody's watching this and they see a painting they love in the studio and want to buy it. I always love kind of getting those messages so um, don't be too shy to write to me if there's something you love and want to kind of have for yourself. Okay, enough about frames. I'm about ready to get back to the desk and start painting, figuring out these new compositions and talking to you a little bit about my artist of the week, Gerhard Richter. So it's really important, I think, to just share a little bit about contemporary artists that I'm influenced by, not just looking to history. And one of the most prolific artists, particularly for abstraction and landscape painting, is Gerhard Richter. He was born in Germany in 1932 and if you look at his website, I'll link it below. Um, I'm also going to link his panorama interview that the Tate did on him, which is amazing. You'll just see the vast quantity of work this guy has produced in his lifetime. But everything he turns his hand to is incredible. I'm going to only just kind of touch on the uh, cloudscapes, the atlas series, the landscapes, seascapes I was kind of really moved by. Um, but everything is just so interesting. You can see the kind of evolution of his work in full cycle from abstraction to figuration photorealism photography and back to abstraction again this guy does not limit himself which is i think a really important part about painting not to limit yourself be authentic to what you're inspired by so german visual artist i think he's most mostly compared to caspar david friedrich another german painter he is i think quite romantic but for now, let's just kind of touch on the elements of his painting which are helpful to me in my practice. It, he heavily uses photography. Um, maybe I should use photography more. His Atlas collection in Germany, which I am so glad I got to see, is 4,000 photographs. Some of them are so kind of simple in composition. They're, they're just photographs of light, of very open, barren landscapes. He really focuses on atmosphere and you know these photographs are almost like paintings themselves and you know there's the sheer quantity of them they take you out of your locality and, and absorb you into Richter's not just his kind of atmosphere but his sense of quietness of of contemplation of beauty and also kind of the devastating power of nature. Um, I think the Atlas series started in 1972, but you can see the kind of like echoes of it throughout different bodies of work he's done. Um, his cloudscapes um, in 1970 are what I am referring to at the moment. They are so muted, some of them in different shades of grey. If, if you look at Walken in 1970, you see the kind of subtle changes of light. These brushstrokes look invisible. But the fact that he does these huge paintings with quite a simple palette, it just shows the kind of the skill that Richter has. It's something that I can only aspire to. Um, I was also looking at the 1969 seascapes. I think there was a nice progression from the seascapes to the skyscapes. It's almost like he was looking at both and then he decided that the sky was more interesting for him. Richter said about these seascapes and skyscapes that he was, with every painting, seeking a form of truth in reality, but slightly blurring these paintings so they weren't quite photographic, was his way of capturing absolute rightness and truth. Sorry, I'm referring to my book here. So it says, there is no such thing as capturing absolute rightness or truth. We always pursue the artistic leading to human truth. So I think it's kind of saying there can only be a approximations, experiments, beginnings over and over again with a painting, particularly looking at light and atmosphere. You're never going to capture it exactly, but in the attempt to take the viewer into a space which is evocative of that kind of almost pioneering look at light and beauty and expansiveness, maybe that's where we see the links to Caspar David Friedrich, his influence in Dresden at the time as a student of the Art Academy. I think Richter was pioneering a way to bring landscape into a contemporary format. Um, with his Atlas studies in photography, just referring back to those, he was using the medium of photography in a way which it had never been used before in landscape kind of collective painting. He was documenting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of landscapes with his camera in a way to help him focus what he was looking at, what he was looking for in a painting. Uh, so he said that, I see countless landscapes 
and a photograph barely one in a hundred thousand I would paint maybe a hundred of those. He's seeking something quite specific. From this I conclude that I know what I want. So it was almost like in in refining what he was looking at, in going through hundreds and hundreds of photographs of dramatic sunsets, seascapes, uh, horizon lines, he was condensing what exactly he was looking for in his painting. So his paintings were almost like quests into his own perception of the world and in maybe creating these quite figurative paintings with a soft light, with a haziness that makes the painting slightly removed from reality. So he was inviting the question of what does this landscape say to you? Uh, he's condensed it down to the most simple, beautiful, exquisite, moment of time and yes it is nature but it's also his interpretation of stillness and atmosphere and maybe truth and I think that's one of the great pursuits of landscape painting which I'm particularly influenced by you know what in capturing this piece of nature this moment in time this sense of colour and light uh, does it make you feel about nature does it take you to a place does it um completely consume your kind of imagination and transport you somewhere. I think these are the elements of landscape which have always captivated me. I think it's why I still paint landscape and every time I start a new painting I'm just seeking that kind of question of where will this painting take me and, and what will it share with the world when I'm finished. So I'm ready to start painting. All this talk of Richter has got me feeling like I want to pick up a paintbrush. I'm sorry we haven't had enough time to go into his abstract stuff, more into his history and journey as an artist. Um, his squeegee paintings, you know, his abstract walled forest paintings. Um, these are also key works which really inspired me when I was studying painting um, at university. Um, and maybe we could go into them in more detail, like in an episode just for that because it feels like a bit of a crime like we're not really giving him the thorough research that he deserves um so i think it would be a good idea to rework uh, an older painting and maybe kind of revamp it uh maybe inspired by you know the kind of lovely muted light that richter does so well we'll see if i can uh, translate a little bit of that into this painting Okay, so looking at the palette which I created for my smaller test studies, um, I'm going to revitalise this um, rather flat painting. Also thinking about what Richter was saying with seeking an element of authenticity in your landscapes when you're painting. I think when I was looking at this landscape, I felt a sense of peace, a sense of expansiveness. Um, there was also quite a dramatic rolling cloud promising rain. Um, so I think finding a balance between maybe a dramatic, ominous cloud, feeling peaceful and optimistic could be a challenge with this work. How to create maybe a darker painting that doesn't feel oppressive and stressful, uh, it can feel quite hopeful. changed quite drastically. I'm really happy with the progression. I think I'm 
on the right track for making this piece more um, what I've envisioned in my head when I started the painting. Um, for those of you who have been following its journey on my Instagram account, you see how quickly oil paintings can change. That's the best thing about them, um, which I love. So I'm gonna keep working on this, uh, maybe even starting um, on some of the new works. Now I think I've got in my head a little bit more about the kind of palette I like. And I love this um, really hazy bank of light that hits into this really Italian green umber, which is the color I'm using actually quite a lot for this piece, um, horizon line. Um, so yeah, for those of you who are interested in the colors I've used for this one, Italian green umber, ultramarine blue, warm white yellow, and a little bit of genuine Chinese vermilion and Turner's yellow. So not many colors for this one. It's quite a muted palette. Um, but then again, just looking at Richter, you see how a muted palette can actually give you more of a sense of realism than maybe using every single colour you own, which is tempting. So thanks for watching this week's episode of Art Life. I hope you enjoyed the kind of studio time and having the vlog style uh, insight into my studio practice. Uh, like and subscribe and please leave any comments below if any thoughts you'd like to share on the episode, any questions you may have. I always love to hear from you guys. Um, and yeah, so thanks for watching and I will see you next week. Bye!